Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's special edition of the Bug Scout broadcast. Hope you're doing well, enjoying spring, wherever you might be in the world. Make sure you say hello in the comments and make sure you like the or love or appreciate the broadcast in the HAPS reaction buttons um, and share with your friends. And yeah, come on in. Uh, so, hello, David. Hello, Henning. Thanks for the Appreciate Award. Yeah, so today I'm really excited to welcome on um, our first guest from the Car Caribbean Islands. Uh, we're bringing on Gavin Campbell to the broadcast and I'll bring him on screen now. Gavin, well, Gavin is a PhD student at the University of West Indies in Jamaica studying terrestrial and aquatic phases of temporary water bodies. Um, he also raised mosquitoes fed on his own blood, which uh, we have some pictures he supplied that we'll take a look at in a moment. And uh, he loves cartoons, superpowers traveling. He cares deeply about mental health and personal development, getting people to appreciate themselves and those around them. And he, um, yeah, I'm going to bring him on without further ado. So welcome, Gavin, to the Bug Scope. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming me. So excited. Yeah. So great to have you here with us today. Um, I, let me just exit something on my screen to make the, okay. Yeah, so great to have you here today. Uh, we have some people rolling in here. Benny, hello, Abe. Hello, Psycho Man. Yeah, I, um, you have a pretty cool website, which I'll share in the, um, in the comments here on HAPS as well. I see that not only do you do uh, research, but you also have listed that you do acting and voiceovers, which is pretty cool as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, what? So, what? To start us off, what led you to give us a little, uh, like, what led you to where you are today with your PhD research? Mm -hmm. So, originally, when I finished my undergrad, I've always wanted to know that I, I've always wanted to do science. So, I always knew that I would get in there some way. And when I finished my undergrad, I wanted to do some work on cave organisms because there hasn't been much done on caves in Jamaica, especially in the past 20 years or so. Um, but going into the first year of that, I realized it was much more hectic than I thought and took much more resources, much more planning. But during that year, I also found on the campus, on the university's campus, there was a body of water that happened when it wasn't in the rainy season. And I saw that there were some birds in there. And I was curious as to why there are birds in there, because at first, I would just think that's just a puddle of water. There's nothing important, nothing special about it. So I went home that very evening and I saw that that entire ecosystem is a whole big area of study and not many people are doing work on it. Not many people have actually paid much attention to it. But ever since finding it, I found it so interesting that there's an entire ecosystem that exists within just a small area and for such a short period of time, but there are still organisms, some insects mostly, that are adapted to living in those ones. And as soon as I found, uh, found out about how to actually collect and sample these areas, I went out that same week and I started collecting ever since then. And I've just been on that project. I kind of tried to do both at the same time, the cave work and the temporary waters work. But then the cave work was really not working out. So I decided to switch full time to the temporary waters work. And everybody like knew, because, because of um, how I would talk about temporary waters much more than the caves, Everybody knew that I was going to go switch to the temporary waters in the long run. They just didn't say anything. So when actually they, they were just like, yep, we know it. Go about it. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely hard to pick and choose sometimes in the science world. Um, yeah. yeah, so here here is that pond that you're, you were talking about, right? And I, that's one of the first things that I did notice as you were saying, all those birds. There's so many birds around there. Yeah, so recently that, that pond was cut, so the vegetation around it is uh, is adding some organic matter to the pond, so the the, um, the birds can come in and feed on the insects that are trapped, that are stuck there, and then when I come, they just fly about. So that's me currently sampling, taking up some water samples um, from the pond to under, analyze under a microscope a little bit later. Uh-huh, cool. Yeah. Um Thanks, Miles, for the Waterworks Award. Very appropriate for a temporary body of water that fills yes. from what um, what does cause it to fill? Where does the water come from for this pond? Yeah, so this pond is mainly or only filled by rainwater. So during the rainy season is when it's most inundated. So the rainy season for us 
is between September to December. That's when it's most uh, voluminous. Um, other than that, there are some times when, it's, uh, when there are short bouts of rainfall that fill it up. But for the most of the year, for the majority of the year, about nine to 10 months of the year, it is dry and it's just focused on the terrestrial aspect. And I was realizing at the end of the, the master's phase of my work, I was realizing that the, the physical environment, the terrestrial environment was quite a big deal. Like they had an impact on each other. And I saw that not many people had done work on the terrestrial aspect of aquatic um, temporary water bodies. So I decided to focus on that specifically for the PhD and, and understanding like both how they individually interact, like how they change over time and also how the terrestrial phase interacts with the aquatic phase. Very cool. So you said that it's dry for nine months of the year? Yeah, so the majority of Only three. Yeah. And, but within those three months, you can have so many different species. Overall, I've collected 36 different species of mainly insects, but also a vertebrate, um, the cane toad. But the majority are insects. And it's so interesting to see that within such a short time, they come in and start flocking the entire pond. And then there can be so many thousands of them afterwards. And it's just impressive because we are not sure where they come from, what triggers them to actually fly there. So there are theories in general, but I haven't been able to actually specifically tell where they're coming from. Um, but it's so interesting to see that they are so ready. As soon as rain falls, they come in, they feed, and then when it dries out, they head back to where they're coming from. Wow, yeah, that is fascinating that they just, it's like part of the routine. Exactly, I love that despite being so temporary. Yeah. yeah. Um, Eliana is saying, cool photo. Looks similar to the pictures of me, Isa, and the fountain in Philadelphia. He, he, he. So <laughs> I have done, in a way, it is a temporary pond. But okay. I won't diverge too much, because I want to hear more about this. And we need to get to those 10 things that we didn't know about temporary ponds, shortly, waters shortly. But right. um, it, I was particularly interested in inviting you on and hearing about your work because I have done a project in Center City, Philadelphia, where I collected all the insects that fell into the um, fountain that, that's across from my museum in Center, in a huge major, like one of the top 10 cities in the USA. Um, and it's very different from yours. Of course, because it's not like on, there's no vegetation. It's um, they do add chemicals like only to control chlorine, though. Sorry, only to control the algae. Um, yeah. But it's like a flowing big fountain. I don't have a picture here, but maybe like maybe we can do a reverse interview in the future where you ask me about my project or something like that if you want to. <laughs> uh, I have um, questions for you right now. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can compare to cross notes. It's very different, I can tell you, though. Like, because the water is flowing in the fountain where I've sampled in Center City of Philadelphia, um, there aren't mosquitoes because mm -hmm. of the way the water is flowing. Um, there are dragonflies that come and try to lay eggs. And I'm just like, no, dragonfly, don't do it because it's a dead end for them. But That's I have, right. yeah, but I have seen like water boatmen and um, also, it's more like it's more like a, um, and I bet you this pond acts a little bit like this too for you, but it's a little bit like a um, like a, a beeble, which is for those of you who are not familiar in the audience, it's a it's a bowl that like like Hymenopterus beast people who study bees will literally take a bowl that's like bright yellow or some other bright color, and they will. Um, like just put water in it, a little bit of soap, and it catches a bunch of insects that just fall in and are not and drown. So that's basically what the fountain acts as, as, long, as well as like a flight intercept trap because there's a bunch of fountains like going up into the sky. And um, but yeah, so that's the gist of it. And well, and I'm guessing it was mainly terrestrial insects that had died off. Yeah, mostly terrestrial. The occasional water strider. Um, no, not water strider, but water boatman, back swimmer, mm. uh, aquatic beetle, but yeah, mostly land. Oh, yeah, anyway, um, 
Cool. Okay. Hi, everyone who's coming in. Hi, Zach and Blue Velvet. I'll take a look for your tick and maybe we can bring it up during the broadcast on coming up on May 4th where we're having a tick expert. Um, nice. And yeah. Hi, Walter. Hi, Yassine. Good to see you. Uh, for anyone who didn't hasn't been with us since the beginning, I'm here talking with Gavin, who is a PhD student at the University of um, West Indies, right? Yep. In Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Uh, working on, he's studying temporary waters. So without further ado, let's get into this and talk about uh, temporary waters. Actually, one one moment, sorry, actually, before we do. Um, can you see, can you click, will you click on your mic cam tab at the bottom, Gavin, and see if for the audio mode it says standard or high quality? It says standard. So will you click on high quality? Yeah. Cool. So it's refreshing you. Okay, cool. Is oh, it that's helpful. Awesome. Hey, Gina. All right, so uh, before we do go start, um, I just want to add one tiny thing to Yasin. Um, I probably will be butchering it, but I want to say Zdratsitsye and Prigat. All right. Yes. Um, oh, and, and once again, for those of those who are asking, I think people are asking after you, um, what are the birds? What are those birds again? Will you type it in the chat for people? The type of yeah. birds, what are there? So I don't know the actual genus and species names, but they're called cattle egrets. They're regular um, Oh, cattle egrets. Yeah. Okay. Um, David, you have missed zero of the 10 facts. So, although some may have been mixed in the intro perhaps, but um, you are here just in time. We're about to jump in. So <laughs> here we go. All right. So everyone can hold up their hand. And then as we go through them, you drop a <laughs> finger. So you take a drink. Cheers. Have water or something. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'll send the first number one through the program. And then you can elaborate on it, Gavin. All right. No problem. All right. Hi, two scoops. Hi, Zach. So temporary waters, I'm not sure if I should like, let everybody read first and then expound. OK, wait, why don't we read it out loud, too, for anyone who's not, who likes the audio side of it? All right, no problem. So any water body that is preceded by temporary, seasonal, intermittent, episodic, ephemeral, vernal, is considered a temporary water body. And these include rivers, streams, ponds, lakes, and some different names that they have around the world are based on their different cultures. So in uh, in Australia, they call some water bodies namas, they call some of them billabongs, and in the Middle East, they call some wadis, and in the Southwestern US, they call some flyers. And they're different names that they get depending on their features and their cultures. But temporary water bodies are pretty much prevalent in every terrestrial ecosystem. There are some sort of ones in the aquatic ecosystems, but there's not much too much um, work done on those ones specifically. And temporary just basically means that at some point of the year, it is dry. And then at some point of the year, it has water and it fluctuates between that. It can be quite standard. So there can be a particular time of year that the water gets um, inundated or the pond gets inundated or the river usually dependent on um, rainfall or any other underground activity, but there has to be some break in the pattern. So wherever there is water at one point, there has to be a loss of water at another point. And in many of them, you have organisms that are specifically adapted to breeding faster and living within these temporary water bodies. And among them, mosquitoes are quite prevalent, especially the lentic ones, the ones that do not flow well. Almost everywhere I've checked, at least in Jamaica, there are mosquitoes, like in bromeliads, in underground holes, in um, tree holes, everywhere. There are some type, some type of mosquito. Everyone's favorite insect. Yeah. <laughs> Ready for number two? Yes. All right, here we go. All right, so temporary waters and their fauna can exist wherever water collects, as I mentioned earlier. So they can include um, rock pools, fields, or 
pools in fields, tree holes, leaves, bromeliads, food containers, puddles, underground holes, and pretty much anywhere water can collect. So um, there are different classifications of temperate waters based on their, their origin and their formation. So you have rock pools, and there are specific fancy names that you can call them. So there are things that are ending with telmata. So phytotelmata are temporary water bodies that are related to plants. So um, ones like the axles of leaves, like in Bromelia, those are called phytotelmata. And thurtelmata are the ones that are created by humans, anthropocene human um, features. So if there are any tires around, if there are any food containers around, and they collect water that are enough to sustain organisms, they're called anthotelmata. There are also some that, um, that exist within snail shells that are called gastrotelmata. So water that collects within very, very tiny snail shells can even host ecosystems of algae and crabs as well too, and a bunch of other things as well. But they all have their own specific kind of, kind of names. The tree holes are called dendrotelmata, but you can call them pretty much anything. There's no standardization on um, what you call temporary water bodies. Cool. Do you have a favorite word for? I use temporary waters a lot because it encompasses yeah. everything. A lot of a lot of the work that I've been seeing other researchers do has been focused on rivers and streams, um, whereas the ponds seem to be kind of neglected. So I just use temporary okay. waters to include everything. Cool, cool. Um, how do you spell, David Howden's asking, how do you spell those specialist names? Like something Tomata. Okay, Maybe. No I will drop the chat. Okay, cool. Um, and David's also saying, all of the water in Paravale wood, my nature reserve, are temporary, I think, although in a wet year, one does retain water drying out only in dry years. Would that count as temporary? Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to the definition for temporary, the full-on official definition is that if it dries out at any point within a, a period of 10 years, it's considered um, temporary. So it can go from very, very short phases of, like, say, one month of drying within 10 years to several years of drying within the 10 years. But they'd all technically be classified as temporary under that definition. But I've seen most researchers refer to it um, within the year. Cool, thanks. And then Benny is asking, where is Gavin from? I am from Jamaica. I'm from the north coast of Jamaica in uh, Montego Bay. And I'm currently in the other side of, on the other side of the island in uh, Kingston, which is the capital of Jamaica. Cool. All right. Uh, so number three? Yes. All right, here we go. So as someone was mentioning um, earlier, there are quite significant reserves of temporary waters, not just um, in their locality, but also around the world, such that over 50% of rivers in the US, Greece, and South Africa are temporary, and 70% of the rivers in Australia are also temporary. And temporary rivers overall contribute around 30% of the discharge globally of, of rivers in general, and temporary waters make up 75% of flooded land worldwide. So when it comes to wetlands specifically, temporary waters are a big, uh, big factor in those ones. So when it comes to places like uh, Florida, the Everglades, temporary waters are a big part of it. They see different fluctuations seasonally and different organisms are adapted to living in them. Particularly um, noted are the, the water birds that flock to these areas seasonally and take, you know, take advantage of these resources. And in one particular study, I saw that around 20% of the Amazon is made up of temporary waters. So Amazon, everybody knows, very big, very green, but also very strong when it comes to the rivers. So when it comes to the rainy season particularly, the temporary waters flood the banks, or the rivers flood their banks and then fill temporary waters around the pond or around the, um, the river, and then can be colonized by other insects and also other organisms as well too. So whereas in Jamaica, the majority of temporary water fauna are insects, there are other places that have actual crocodiles and larger organisms that use temporary water as well too. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now that I think about it, 
one of the temporary waters that I have enjoyed uh, peering into is in Borneo. I was there in 2015 and there were a bunch of pitcher plants and the pitcher plants, like, it was so fun to look into them because each one, well, usually it was mosquitoes in there, but mm -hmm. it was still fun to look inside and see what was collecting and taking advantage of um, the pitcher plants. It's so insane to see there are so many different kinds of niches around and so many insects or organisms in general can take advantage of them. Like beforehand, you wouldn't think to check a pitcher, a pitcher plant for mosquitoes, but now pitcher plants hold mosquitoes. It's so weird. Yeah. And you, you know what else took advantage of them too is the orangutans. They would check grab the pitcher plants and just pick it up and drink it like it was a cup of water which it basically was, so. Okay, cool. I am going to add that to my thesis, temperate waters feeding orangutans. There you go. Yep. <laughs> yep. Um, cool. All right. So, you too, Benny. Um, let's go to the next one. All right. Number four. <laughs> so, some countries have no permanent rivers or permanent uh, reservoirs or lakes. So they have only seasonal ones. So they'll, at a particular time of the year, when the rain falls, they will fill up. But other than that, they be dry for the rest of the year. And places that do not have temporary rivers, or countries that do not have temporary or permanent rivers, sorry, include Kiribati, and, uh, Kiribati the Bahamas, and Kuwait. And they rely mainly on rainfall, importation, or desalination of water. Or of seawater, technically. Cool. Um, shall we go right to the next one, too? Yeah. Right. Number five. So for the fifth one, communities of insects in a river can be very distinctly different from like disconnected pools less than a meter away, and these can even host rare organisms to the region. So I recently went on a trip this past weekend sampling both the river and also some disconnected temporary pools at the side. And it was so cool to see that the river has own specific organisms, but when you come to the, the temporary pool, it's very starkly different. So within the pools, there are mosquitoes and beetles and chironomids, but in the river itself, there are mostly snails, trichopterans, and odonates. So it's, it's, it's so insane to see that within less than a meter, you could take one step and you're in a whole different environment within uh, the size of your palm that is not much bigger than that can that can host scores of so many different insects and it's just impressive because it adds diversity to an entire region and you don't really think much about the temporary pools because oh it's just going to dry out a little bit there's not much that can live in there but they are the homes for so many different organisms that will literally fly in to find those particular spots from wherever they're coming from and it's impressive too to see the difference between those different uh, pools. There was one of the pools too that had a, a, tubificid, a tubificid worm in there, and it was just insane to see because I've never seen any in the in real life before. Wait, what was it? A tubificid worm. A two what worm? Tubificid. Tubificid? I don't know if I'm familiar with that. Um, it's kind of like a sludge worm. Okay. Yeah, so they're normally in more organic matter organic um, environments, but they, they kind of stick up out of the soil and they do this wafting motion to mm -hmm. get themselves oxygen. So it's really interesting to see like the diversity between those individual pools that are still also closely physically related. So within another meter from one pool, you could have a whole different ecosystem as well within those small temporary pools. Cool. Yeah, different offerings. And, and I bet like whoever arrives first helps to shape whatever organisms arrive first, maybe help to shape what ends up um, yeah. like settling there, perhaps. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, David Howden saying, is that because some predators cannot be there with the water going? Yeah. So a lot of the times when it comes to flowing waters, organisms or some organisms are not adapted to living in them. So they go specifically to the more stagnant waters and the most notable one are ones are mosquitoes. When it comes to any flowing water, you're not going to find mosquitoes there. But when it comes to stagnant water, they are going to be quite prevalent 
as much as possible. And some other organisms, like um, surface skaters, they can't really skate much on choppy water. So they kind of stay either to the side of the river or go to one of these smaller pools. Cool. Um, I want to hear David is saying, I know the water that dries up. The water dry as a, wait, I know water that dries up helps is helpful for amphibians as it prevents fish from being there, for instance. Yeah, so that's another thing too when it comes to temporary waters. Because of their small sizes, it actually restricts the the movement and success of other larger organisms. So with all those temporary pools that I saw last week, there were never any fish in them or ever any shrimp. But within the river itself there were fish and shrimp. So there was um, a lower predator pressure when it comes to the temporary water bodies that the organisms that the insects themselves can take advantage of. And when it comes to larger aquatic predators, like um, Bellastomatids or the giant water bugs, those ones are kind of going to be too big for some of these smaller temporary water bodies. So that predator, again, won't be there. So it's kind of like size restriction, size restriction for the very, very small organisms, giving them a place where they can kind of hide out. Yeah. As you... So... So I watched like a video, which we can post. I don't have the link uh, copied right now, but we can post it in the chat, at least at the end, so people can check out your sampling process. It was a seven minute video, very cool. Um, I got to, you got to see, viewers got to see how you were measuring like the air and the temperature, right, as well. And then also you sampled um, the water to get microorganisms that you'd look at later. And then you also sampled the macroinvertebrates and I might be missing, am I, am I missing anything else? No, those are the main components. Cool. Yeah. And I guess my question, since you were talking about some organisms that might not be able to stay because it's not suitable for them, like, was there, was, has there been an organism that you got only like once and you were like, whoa, like this made it in here. Like maybe it was just passing by and wasn't really staying, but you were there at the right time to... Mm -hmm to collect it in your sample, that makes yes. sense. The first one that comes to mind is a hydrometrid. I only ever saw it once on one particular day over the entire four years that I've been sampling. And oh, it's okay. just crazy that, it ha that I haven't seen it again. Yeah. Um, You're gonna have was, to tell, describe to us what that is. Oh, so a hydrometrid is like a, walk, a walking stick, but an aquatic walking stick. So it's okay. like very slow moving on the surface of the water. It looks very thin and has very fragile, thin limbs. And it, yeah, it's really not the best adapted to walking on um, waters like that when it comes to, compared to other um, surface skaters like hydrometrids and gerids because they're a bit slow moving. But they're still, they're still interesting because they're so, so stick-like and fragile. And it's just interesting to see them move like, you know, as if no one's watching them. Yeah, I'll, I'll put the name in the chat so people can uh, check it out if they want to. Yeah, no cool. I've, I actually am not at all familiar with that. I was like, I am familiar with water scorpions, which I'm guessing they're related. They're also true bugs. Yeah. But um, I don't know. So there are familiar. water scorpions in some other pools, but not in my temporary pool. So it's even on the same campus, but just not in my pool. Wow. Um, other, another species that I've found um, was a different species of mosquitoes in uh, in Jamaica. It's called, let me just type it up, Sorophora jamaicensis. Yeah, so Sorophora jamaicensis. And during my regular sampling, I would like take the net, scoop up and everything. But I was just walking through the pond one day and I saw this much thicker, fatter mosquito. And I was like, what's this? So I bent down and I scooped up, um, scooped it up with um, a dropper, mm -hmm. and I, I identified it as that particular species. And it was insane because it wasn't in the regular open waters; it was in the shallowest of the shallow waters that the net itself couldn't access. So if I hadn't mm -hmm. searched through physically, I wouldn't have seen it. And it's it's so strange to see like within such a small water body, there are even like very very small regions that organisms would specifically inhabit that a regular net or a regular sample wouldn't be able to collect them. Yeah, totally. The little microclimates and just like the yeah. little nooks and crannies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like uh, that. 
of things. But it makes me think that I'm always missing something, you know? Like if I didn't step that one or stop that stop at that one point and search, I wouldn't have seen it. So imagine all the other things that I have missed because I didn't do it for everything. Yeah. Uh say la vie. C'est la vie. That's, yeah. There's not much we can do about it except for long for that completeness. <laughs> um Oh, two Scoop says, typing it out doesn't help me a whole lot when I'm Googling. I can't spell it even though you spell it out. Oh, but do you see it? Do you see it written in the chat? You can copy and paste that. So yeah. is that mosquito that you shared? Um, Sorophora jamaicensis. Um, mm -hmm. Is that endemic to Jamaica? I'm, so, I'm asking because the name. Yeah, so the name originally, I thought it was endemic as well too, but... It was only first described or found in Jamaica, which is why the name Jamaicans is. Okay. But it's been found in other countries as well, too. Okay, cool. Yeah, mostly tropical countries. Tropical or neotropical like, countries. Okay, cool. Um, cool, cool. Uh, all right, let's go to number six. So one hand down and one hand to go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Pushing to the program. Right, it's so adult organisms that are exposed to drying can have can increase their reproductive input, leaving them with a shorter lifespan. And this is because their eggs are going to be more drought resistant than the adults are. So they put as much resources as they can into making eggs that can resist the drought because they know they can't. And this occurs in different organisms in temporary water bodies, including fish, insects, and amphibians. So um, when it comes to surviving temporary water bodies, the main factor or the main yeah the main harmful factor is drying out especially when it comes to aquatic organisms so they try to find different ways that they can adapt to that particular environment and one of the things that they do is put a lot of resources into their eggs and then when the water comes back after being dry for a few months or a few years even after water comes back they can just start things back up start things over and there are even some, like within my pond, there are some organisms that are quite well adapted to that. And they they can produce their, uh, they, go, they go through their entire life cycle within eight days. I should probably see what wow. the name is. So um, it's Eulimnabia intellaris, which is a branchiopod. I'm just going to just add everything to the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so branchiopod. And... Genus, the genus name, or species name, is Eulimnabia infularis. And what's interesting about this? Mm -hmm. What's interesting about this one is that I recently found it in my pond, like within the first few months, I found it within the pond. And a few, actually 2020, last year, there were some researchers that found it as well within the U.S. Virgin Islands. And strangely, it was also found on a university campus, which is just insane. So I know we're thinking that all university campuses in the Caribbean have their own um, little clam shrimp. So the general name <laughs> is shrimp. And it was just really cool. So they recently named it um, Eulimnidia insularis. And it's for Jamaica, it hasn't been found here since in eight to eight years. So it's been a, quite a long time since it's been ever documented here. But then again, there not there were not many people that were actually actively looking for it, so it could just could just um gone by the wayside. But it's still interesting to see like that that newly described species is also found here in Jamaica. That's so with awesome. yeah with that um species I kind of got off topic there. So with that species, they have their they can go through their entire life cycle within eight days, and they are parthenogenic. Most of the for the most of the part, they're parthenogenetic. And they can just keep reproducing just by having their own eggs without mating. And then mm -hmm. when the pond dries out, they die out, but their eggs remain. And they can remain for several months in the oh, dry season. Wow. Yeah. And then as soon as water comes, they're ready. They're just ready to go and lay their eggs well, in the next eight days and everything. But what's interesting with them too is that even though their eggs are all within the water, not all of them hatch out at the same time because it's a, it's a strategy called bed hedging and it's basically to hedge their beds when it comes to hatching so if the pond fills up and it only fills up for say three days if all of them were to hatch out none of them would have been able to actually get to their adult stage and make wow. new eggs. so a few of them hatch out 
and then a few of them still remain inactive until a particular point in time. So how them, do they choose? Sibling rivalry. <laughs> no idea how they choose. I'm not sure. I've even had some. I've, I've done some in the, some inundation experiments, and they lasted for ten days. And I put the soil in. Some of them would hatch out on the first day, and then some of them would hatch out, say, on the third day. So there was nothing that I did any any uh, anything special. There was nothing special that I did to trigger this or trigger that. But different individuals hatched at different times, and it was just interesting. So that's something. Another thing that I want to check out to see. How is it that this entire population can say, hey, some of us are going to hatch now, but some of us are, some of, some of us are going to hatch later. And with that cycle, you can kind of see where they're, they're always going to be present. So if the pond only dries out, if the pond um, is only inundated for three days, those ones will die out, but the other eggs will remain. And if the pond lasts for eight days, the ones that first hatched are able to like make more eggs and deposit into the, the water and then the soil. And if it dries out on the ninth day, then the second batch would hatch out, but the first batch would have already made their eggs. So they're always available to produce eggs and still proliferate in um, in the in the pond. Oh. So, so this little crustacean is totally adapted to life in a temporary in temporary water. Yeah, it is, and it's yeah. so. Yeah. That, that which is so different from some of the organi other organisms who come and go or migrate to and from. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Number seven. Here we go. Uh, so this one, this was another adaptation to temporary waters that I was trying to leave out because I knew it was here. So some spadefoot toad individuals can become cannibalistic when they detect that their pool is drying out, uh -oh. and they this to increase their food intake and speed up their growth so that they can become mobile adults before the pond dry load. Wow, and that's that's something that I did not know for sure, for sure. That's very yeah. cool. <laughs> cool. Because it happens in other groups as well too. So giant flies and beetles also do it. But I found it so interesting when it came to the spadefoot toads because normally they'd be omnivorous and they'd eat different plant matter or decaying matter within the pond or pool that they're in. And when, it, when they detect that, oh, it's drying out a bit too fast and I can't really like become an adult at my omnivore rates, it will switch to its carnivore rates and switch to its carnivore morph and then eat its organ, its other individuals or siblings, wow. relatives, the it is, it is, it is relatives. So it's like they do that to speed up their development so that they are not dependent on the aquatic environment. So even if it is drying out, the adults can still hop away. But when it comes to the tadpoles themselves, they are kind of just restricted to the aquatic environment. Mm -hmm. The original Hunger Games right there. <laughs> yes. Wow. Intense. That species, that species was found in um, in the southwest U.S., where it's a bit drier than normal. So I can see why the adaptation kind of persisted. Mm -hmm. All right. Number eight. Here we go. This one is going to feature Jamaica. Oh, yeah. Yay. Yes. So yeah. there is a species of social crab in Jamaica that has a life cycle that is tied to bromeliads. And each bromeliad holds a single colony of crabs with one reproductive female and the rest of the crabs in the, organ in the, in the bromeliad are her children and her caretakers, much like bees. So you have one mm -hmm. queen that lays eggs and everybody else is non-reproductive and oh. take care of the queen. And it's one of the rare examples that you have of paternal care among crustaceans. So it's it's really, when I first found that out, I was amazed because I didn't expect crabs to live in bromeliads, first of all. And for them to have a social structure where there is one reproductive female and everybody else beneath them is um, a worker, basically designed or yeah, designed to just serve the queen and take care of the environment. And there will be even cases of that particular crab cleaning out different axles of the leaves so that their offspring can survive and have different brood chambers for the smaller ones versus the larger ones. There will be some times when there is a, a main queen, but there's also a secondary possibly um, reproductive um, underling. So there are times when that underling can leave the nest or leave the, um, the bromeliad 
and find another Bermuda to start its own colony. But most of the times they stick to the one particular colony and then die out when that um, bromeliad dies out. So the bromeliad has a life cycle of three years and that's exactly how long that crab lives as well, or those crabs live as well. So they're very intricately tied to um, temperate water bodies or bromeliads specifically because the region that they're in is very porous, very filled with limestone. So they do not have much surface water they can adapt to, but they still found some water in bromeliads and can kind of tie their life to to, uh, to that particular species, to that particular environment, sorry. Oh, I'm not hearing you, you're muted. Sorry, yeah. Um, how big are they about? Are they very small crabs to, to live in a bromeliad? So the bromeliad, the, the size of the axle would be about this big. So I wouldn't expect them to be bigger than... Oh, okay. This. That's, that's yeah. de decent size for life in a bromeliad. Yeah. But there are some other ones that are smaller. The non-reproductives are much smaller. And they're even like casts of non-reproductives. So they'd be like uh, one this size, and then this size, and then this size. Uh, cool. Wow. That's like, there's obviously social social insects like bees and honeybees. It's honeybees and termites and ants. But I had not heard of something anywhere near that until right now. So very cool. <laughs> yeah. So someone's asking if they ever revolt against the queen. Um, I, based on my readings, I haven't seen a case where they revolt against the queen. They sometimes just branch off and make their own colony, but not much work has been done since it's been discovered back in the day. So there definitely needs more work, more research done. It needs to be more research done to find out exactly what the, the dynamics are for their little ecosystem. All right. Number nine. Here we go. This one's really awesome, too. All right. So from the air, adult mosquitoes can detect the presence of predators within certain water bodies and lay their eggs where there are either fewer predators or no predators. And because of this, mosquitoes are more likely to lay their eggs in newly formed temporary water bodies than in permanent ones with established predators. So because they want their, their offspring to survive and live as much as they can. They try to decrease any risk. And one of the things that they can do is detect the presence of, the presence of um, predators in their waters. So if there is a water body that has a bunch of predators, they're gonna be like, let me find somewhere else to lay my eggs. So there is this kind of selection pressure for, um, for mosquitoes and also temporary water bodies. So when it comes to temporary water bodies, because they are newly formed and they don't have that many um, established predators, especially within the first few days, the mosquitoes will lay their eggs in there and they'd be able to take advantage of all the resources in that newly formed water body. So within the water body, the newly formed temporary water body, there would be a bunch of dead organisms, dead insects and plants that they'd be able to feed on. So they would get a lot of food right there, but there wouldn't be as many predators. So their population can really take off right after that. And when it comes to the predators that would normally fly in, they have a little lag about um, three days or so, whereas the mosquitoes can, like, as soon as the rain falls that day, that very night, they'd be they'd be able to lay their eggs in the water and start their life cycle. Whereas the mosquito, the predators, would take a little lag to get there and start to um, control them. So mosquitoes are quite resilient, and that's one of the things I've I've discovered about them. There is no magical do one thing and then mosquitoes are gone forever because they're so. Um, prevalent, so resilient, they'd be able to find water somewhere and breed somewhere and be able to still do the terrible things that they do. So one of the things that I wanted to, to focus on is not not removing certain water bodies. So within my pond, which is big enough to allow for predators to come and feed, in, feed on them, they can help to control the population of mosquitoes. But when it comes to very, very small, tiny bottles, tiny, uh, tiny, water, tiny water bodies, like with um, the size, like one with the one that is the size of your palm, the larger predators wouldn't be able to, like, to get access into those waters. So the mosquitoes would have a, a free ground to just breed as much as they want and take over as much as they want without predators flying in and controlling them. So having more temperate water bodies like that size would be able to actually facilitate not just the, the mosquitoes, but also the predators that would 
eat the mosquitoes and increase in numbers to fly around to different places. So it'd be a better, I think it would be a better strategy when it comes to control because instead of having um, pumping sterile mosquitoes into the atmosphere or into the environment or having different uh, pesticides continuously pumped, the natural environment would keep doing its thing because these predators are dispersive. They'd actually search out temporary water bodies because they know that an abundance of food is there and less competition is there. So they naturally just want to go keep finding different water bodies that have these resources and control them. Mm, that's a really good thing to think about too when it comes yeah, to dealing with mosquitoes. And of course, one of the big culprits that we hear about when it comes to where mosquitoes are breeding and growing um, it's oftentimes like little tiny man man-made containers like bottle caps or like the inside of a tire that's abandoned or something like that. And, mm. or like a plastic container that has started to fill. And a lot of those containers are not very, are not big enough for okay. other, yeah, other, the predators of the mosquitoes to come and establish too. So very good. Mm. Yeah. And of course, uh, thinking about that leads us to ask the question, we have a couple people asking here, how do they detect the predators? Oh, so they, they have, know? so they have particular chemosensors which can detect chemicals within the water and different predators have different um, chemicals called chiromones. And if they're, if they're present in the water, they'd be able to just produce these. It's kind of like pheromones with, with us or with, um, with mammals. They can produce a particular smell and you can, can tell what species or what age or what, um, what environment they're coming from or even how healthy they are based on how they smell and that's what uh, mosquitoes use they detect caramones in the air of the water and then they can sell they can tell if it's um if it's okay to lay their eggs in it or if it's too dangerous to put to lay their eggs in it um there are also some adaptations that mosquitoes use for for understanding the environment so they, they can kind of tell if it's worth laying their eggs in versus um, if it's not going to be very beneficial. So if they know that like um, certain organs are going to like flock to that area, they prefer to do all their egg laying all at once. And there's even one species that uh, that lays, that can hold their eggs in for like several months during the dry season. And as soon as it rains, they lay all their eggs at once. And that actually happened in my pond. And I had to go through over 20,000 mosquitoes in some of my samples. So it's it, it's kind of hectic, but within that first few days, they just like kind of petered out. Their numbers decreased quite quickly. So they, they were able to get a, a, a leg up on those other organisms. So they can kind of wait exactly out or wait specifically out for rainfall, lay their eggs immediately, and then let it be, and they'll keep um, proliferating after that. Wow, that's really amazing. It makes mosquitoes seem so, I don't know, fine-tuned. And yes, they are. They're so specific. And it's it's insane because the more I read up about them and the more I learn about them, the more I see that they are incredibly resilient. They are tough. They can do so many things. And trying to get rid of them might just cause them to get even smarter and be harder for us to, to exterminate. So it's, it's really tough. It's a tough situation to deal with. Yeah. Um, Two Scoop says, I never smell danger. <laughs> and then David Howden says, I trust you carefully keyed out each of the 20K mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to actually keying them out, most of them, um, most of them of that particular species look similar. They have this particular green tinge to them. So if they have the green tinge, I just count them as that. But keying out every single one would take several months and I am, I don't know how that kind of time, unfortunately, but I do check for other species of um, other mosquitoes. So if anything looks a little bit weird, I'll definitely inspect it. But most of them do pretty much look quite similar with the green tinge. Yeah. Um, and since we're on the topic of mosquitoes, mm -hmm. we got to share these pictures over here. <laughs> Um, and I'm curious to learn more about uh, what you were up to, of course, with these. Let's shift around the photos a bit. Uh, so to here, why why were you feeding mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so one of the things that I really wanted to do, because I had a, a strong dislike for mosquitoes at the time before I started my work on them, I wanted to find some way to get rid of them as much as possible. And one thing that I wanted to do was quantify how much certain predators can actually reduce their numbers, reduce the numbers of mosquitoes in their aquatic stages. So I wanted to feed them mosquitoes to see how many they could eat per day. Um, originally, I wanted to use some donated blood and use this particular contraption to be able to actually get them to feed. But after trying about three times, I realized they did not like the contraption, even though it was at, at room temperature, it was good. <laughs> um, not room temperature, it was at body temperature, and it was good blood. They did not like it. Of the, the hundred in the first cage, only about two or three, what three of them would feed. And I would need several hundred um, eggs or larvae per day. So that was not cutting it. So what I had to do was stick my hand in there. And they loved that. <laughs> and it was just insane because... So when I started out, I had a colony of around 100 um, adult individuals. And I stick my hand in there for about half an hour. They'd feed. i just pull my hand out. But then after a while, um, the numbers got bigger. And I got a colony of about 2,000 to 3,000. 30 minutes was not cutting it at that point. So thankfully for Aedes aegypti, the majority of them would feed within the first five minutes. So I just have to like stick my hand in there, play some loud music, not look at it and just like scream throughout to be able to actually survive through the whole situation. And then afterwards, shake my hand off, pull them out or pull my hand out and then just tie it up and then give them some room to lay their eggs. But wow. when it comes to raising mosquitoes, that is one of the more guaranteed ways it's definitely the way you can for sure get access to a lot of mosquitoes a lot of eggs um, from those mosquitoes and thankfully it did work i was able to get so many overall i've gotten over 200,000 mosquitoes and they've been very very helpful in getting that aspect done and um, the particular organism i was working with was a notonectid called notonecta indica just gonna add that for the group oh yeah yeah, so I'll, I'll share the over. image. Oh, yeah, I'll yeah. share the image of all the the bites as well for people to see that you did. So, after that, minutes, you could have all of these different bumps on my hand. That would, at first, they did scratch, but over time, you learn not to not to scratch them because if you scratch them, they just get worse. So, <laughs> so you just have to kind of ignore <laughs> it for a while. But thankfully, within a few hours most of the bumps would go down and the urge to scratch would be very, very minimal. And I do this about once a week or so, so it wouldn't, wasn't too, too bad. Mm. Like once per week, gonna get a two days to recover, things are good. But <laughs> I, I, I ended up dreading it at the end of it and I, I wanted to stop feeding. Thankfully, I got to finish all the, the aspects of my research at that point. And it was a relief to be able to kind of just pour some hot water on them all when everything was done. Oh, and, say goodbye. Yeah, like I gave them my literal blood. I would say sweat and tears, but like I literally have some grandkids and great great grandkids because they have my blood. Yeah, it was really, uh, it was really cool. Yeah, did did out of curiosity, did the bites and the, your reaction to them change over time? And how many, like, how many times did you do this? So overall, I had two colonies at the start. One was Culex nigropapus and the other was Aedes aegypti. Just gonna add this to the chat. Everyone would know um, Aedes aegypti. Yeah, oh yeah, Aedes so, aegypti. Yeah, so I had Aedes aegypti and Culex nigropapus. And I was trying to use both of them to see which one would be better. So which one would be like more... Um, Prolific, prolific in producing eggs and larvae. Originally, um, I had both of them and I eventually chose um, Aedes aegypti because its life cycle was much shorter. Its eggs could be um, stored much more reliably and also they were much more blood feeding. So with the, the Culex uh, mosquitoes, they could really resist me actually. Like I stick my hand in there and I just have it in there. Very few of them would actually come in even after starving them for several days, or some wow. few of them would come in back. So they were just kind of, they were badass. So they were not going to be <laughs> efficient to actually come and um, 
come and give me my hundreds of mosquitoes I would need per day. But the thing about that, in the first instance with Culex, they were painful, yes, but over time, it was nothing. Like, I could literally not feel it when they were biting me and, like, drinking my blood. Unfortunately, wow. that was not the one that ended up being the most, um, most efficient one. So even though it was painless for that one, they didn't give me what I needed. But um, the Aedes aegypti, they would always be ready to feed. They'd be always ready to just chow down on my blood. But over the time, their pain, their bites were still painful. And overall, I think it was around 15 times that I had to blood feed, um, blood feed the Aedes, Aedes wow. colonies. 15 times. Yeah. Did it get yeah. easier or harder over time to stick your <laughs> hand in there willfully? It got easier at the, the end when I knew that, hey, I got everything that I needed. So everything okay. Like top it up for now and then you can just throw them all away, burn them and let them go. But it was still difficult like to the very end. Like it was still very painful. I would still like be relieved when I take my hand out at the end of those five minutes. Uh -huh. how, did you how did you get them off? Did you just kind of shake your hand or when they're done, they're done and they leave? Yeah, so I just shake my hand. So some of them will stay on my hand even when they're done. So I'd just like shake okay. my hand and slowly pull it off while shaking. Yeah. And then Lara is asking, is it common for researchers in your field to offer their own arm as you did? So when it comes to more developing countries, it is more common to put your arm in there or some body part. Actually, I think it's only arms. No one uses legs as much as I think. Um, okay. But when it comes to other um, developed countries, they use either other animals or they have these particular contraptions that they use to um, warm the blood and give a membrane over the the blood itself for them to feed on i tried that with mine because we did have those resources but it they were not doing as much as i'd like them to do so i had to go back to the the roots or the, yeah. the bare bones of it um, <laughs> also I, hmm? I was gonna say 80s aegypti is specialized on humans too right mm -hmm. that's the day flying one which i believe is invasive in the usa at this point as well everywhere <laughs> yeah everywhere yeah yeah so I, I bet th that their favorite food is people. So they really do love people, and it's it's really interesting to see them um, feed because they will come in, feed really quickly, and then fly away for the most part. But some of them will stay on you, and they don't hesitate. Like when as soon as you put your hand in there, they are coming. There is no encouraging them or anything. They will come <laughs> immediately. Even if you breathe at the the cage, they will come to where you are trying to poke through poke through the cage to get to you. So they're, they're tenacious. Yeah. And then Two Scoops is asking, is there a risk of disease spread? I guess, where did you source your mosquitoes? Uh, so there is a very, very small risk of disease spread when it comes to raising them um, from eggs. So I got most of mine from, they were eggs to adults, so they did not get oh, exposed. Okay. From eggs to um, egg larvae and pupae. So they didn't get exposed to the... Um, anybody's blood that would be infected with any, with any um, pathogens. There is a, a small chance of the of them as eggs and larvae having pathogens in them, but thankfully that wasn't the case for me. I'm totally fine, no issues so far, and it's been almost a year now, so I'll go with that. Um, so there was a risk, but I had to take it for the research because it was not going to get done any other <laughs> For <because> science. For <laughs> science. I, I even have a plan to be like, okay, Check yourself regularly to make sure that if anything does happen, you have these kind of medications and everything to take care of it just in mm -hmm. case something does happen. But I'm just very glad that nothing did and that we're able to get the data and support the murder of mosquitoes using biological predators. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, I think you sort of answered this maybe, but in case you have any other notes about it, AA is asking any effects from that in the long run. Mm. So for me, there haven't been any effects after the itching that would die down about a day or two afterwards. But I don't I haven't gotten any negative um, any negative um, effects since then. I was thinking maybe like having a few thousand mosquitoes feed on my blood every day would kind of decrease my blood volume too much. But it really didn't do anything. Like the drops that they would take are very tiny compared to the amount my body can produce. So even if it was like once a week, like I was still able, still able to get back up. So there was no negative side effect that I personally encountered. And there are even, yes, there are researchers that do this um, as a part of their job. They feed mosquitoes their blood. Their yeah. 
Yeah, so you got a like a snippet of it, and there's other people in the world who do this on the regular, like throughout the year, year to year, which is pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, David's asking, do you only have one person feed them to avoid risk of disease spread if a colleague was infected? Yeah, so I, I was the only one that fed them, and surprisingly, not many other people wanted to stick their hand in the, inside of a cage of a few thousand mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> So it was just me feeding them to minimize any risks, and I would be extra vigilant when I was outside to make sure that no outside mosquitoes would mm. bite me to transmit or proliferate any infections among my colony. And I was inside most of the time as well, too, because of corona. Um, so it was something that I was very keen on and aware of to make sure that my mosquitoes are relatively clean and healthy. And I still had to like kill them at the end of the day because... You can't release a few thousand ADC plant mosquitoes into the <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Oh, your poor babies. <laughs> did, their job, though. did you wait? So, did you? So, like, did you offer them sugar or like flowers or something like that too? Because that's what, like, the adult, for anyone who's like not very familiar with mosquito biology, the adults will visit flowers for nectar and simple, simple sugars, basically. And probably the, Females too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did have a, a sugar solution that I would feed them every day. So there would be, on Sundays would be my blood feeding day. So they'd be fed on my blood. But every other day throughout that, they'd be fed a sugar solution of 10% sucrose. And that changed that every day. They really, they like it. Like the mosquitoes all like sugar overall, but it wasn't anything that was like super crazed upon. So like with my hand in there, they like flock to it immediately, but when it came to the sugar, they was like, "Okay, cool, we'll feed whatever we want." So nice, yeah, cool, uh, cool, cool. All right, shall we venture to number ten? Yes. So this or... one, this one isn't specifically um to to temporary water bodies, but I found it was a cool fact because there were some that I saw personally. So aquatic insects constitute 40 to 100% of the diets of nearby terrestrial spiders. And in one particular study, there was a decrease in the species richness of spiders um, in relation to distance. So the further away they are, further away um, they were, the fewer number of spider species there were um, in relation to that water body. So as soon as organisms get, adult, get to their adult stage and can fly out of the water, they get caught in the nets of the spiders nearby. And you can see the majority of the spiders kind of line up around that water body in preparation for that. And it's it was it was interesting to me too because there were some instances within my pond where I saw about four species of spiders in the pond, and I was concerned. Well, not concerned, but I was interested because it wasn't like the other areas around it, and I was wondering why. But after reading about um, this particular thing, I realized why. Like there are so many organisms that are able to become adults and then fly out into the terrestrial environment. That's kind of like a, a cross ecosystem flow. And the mosquito, the spiders um, within the environment are able to take advantage of that by kind of preparing and getting ready. And there were even some studies that that checked on the, the carbon and nitrogen of these, these spiders, see where they're coming from, where their carbon and nitrogen are coming from. And a significant portion was coming from the water itself too. So not just with temporary water bodies, but also permanent water bodies, aquatic insects are really important to their diets, oh, to the spiders' diets. Very cool. Yeah, yeah I love spiders too. If, if you're yeah. around next week, Gavin, we have Sips and Spiders as a one of our yeah. program things here on the Bug Scope. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to talk more spiders on there. Awesome. I'm, I'm, I haven't really gotten much expertise or experience when it comes to spiders. So I really want to get into it. And one of my favorite um, groups so far are the, the jumping spiders, the salids, or salidae. No, oh, wait. Uh, is it salidae? The jumping spiders, salticidae? Salticidae, yeah. Salidae is a, a hemipteran. So salticidae. So those ones I find really cool because they're like, I love seeing their little their, um, legs. Yeah, their legs do the little thing around their face. And so cool. Yeah, yeah. they are. I, yeah, very cool. Oh, here David's saying that, that going back to the mosquitoes, they have a blood dinner and a sugar dessert. So yes. Maybe some of them are too full on that blood that they didn't leave room for dessert. Yeah. 
that's actually one of the things that they would do. So like whenever the females, especially for Aedes aegypti, whenever they are introduced to blood, they would like empty their 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 abdomens or their intestines of the sugar in order to make space for the blood. So they, you, there would be sometimes um, you would see them kind of like pooping out or peeing out a like a white um, crystalline um, liquid in order to make space for the blood. So they will always wow. ditch sugar in favor of blood. That's really that's a really interesting observation. It makes sense. I mean, the blood meal in the wild is not as easy to get probably like getting finding flowers for simple sugars and nectar and whatnot is a passive um, journey. But then when you go get that blood meal, it's especially risky because mm -hmm. that's when you get squished if you're not careful. Yeah. So, so best to make most of it. Oh, hello everyone. We have Hi. some viewers joining. Uh, Peter on the HAPS team is saying we're tuning in now as part of our tutorial Tuesday. Hello yeah. everybody. Yeah, we're using some of the HAPS tools here where I have Gavin as a guest. He's a researcher in Jamaica yeah. who studied, uh, would you say you studied the ecology of the, temp yeah. of the temporary ponds? Yeah. The temporal ponds, or, yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use the word ephemeral when you describe the ponds? Uh, so I don't use the word ephemeral unless it dries out within, say, three days. So okay. there are some bodies that I have uh, been studying that dried out within three days. So they would fill up dramatically after rainfalls, but within three days they dry out. And that doesn't give much time for anything to fly in and colonize it. So it just basically is flooded land. Um, so there's not much uh, aquatic development for those kinds of ones. So those I would consider ephemeral, but I don't study those ones specifically because there's not much in the water instead. Cool. Yeah. Um, do you get, do you get like, I guess, what are some of the, um, do you ever get ephemeroptera or mayflies or stoneflies or is, are there not, you do? Okay. Yeah, so, um, in Jamaica, the plecopterans, the stoneflies are not a thing. We don't have plecopterans and also we don't have megalopterans as well. So we do have everything else. So when it comes to the ephemeropterans, we do have mayflies that come in. They are, their numbers aren't as great as some of the other organisms, but they are there at times. And we do have odonates as well too. Mostly um, dragonflies. There are some adult damselflies that fly around, but I've never seen their offspring within the pond. And I'm guessing it's because the water, the dissolved oxygen in the water is a bit too low for them, but the, the dragonflies are able to persist. And there even sometimes, when it comes to the drying phase of the pond, the dragonflies, the <laughs> dragonfly nymphs, the dragonfly nymphs are able to actually resist drying out for a few days. So if the pond dries out for one day and then it fills back up, then they're able to go back and continue their aquatic lifestyle. Um, but not many organisms that I saw were like that. So the chironomids could do that, the dragonflies could do that, and some of the notonectids could do it. But the majority of them would die off. Oh, and okay. like one of the one of the things that I've been studying specifically with um, with the PhD is all the phases of the pond. So normally, traditionally, it would be just the aquatic phase that people are focused on. But I'm also collecting insects in the terrestrial phase. And just between those phases, you have the, the flooding phase where as soon as rain falls, the terrestrial insects are drowned and just trapped in the water. And then the drying phase where in the aquatic organisms that aren't able to become adults, they kind of start dying out. And I see that there are different communities there as well too. So within the flooding phase, there are things that I would get that I wouldn't normally get in the terrestrial phase using um, a sweep net. And I've even found an endemic snake there one time, like it drowned. Uh, so a drowned it, snake? A drowned snake. So it was it was most likely in the soil already. So when mm. it when it rained, it flooded, but I wouldn't have seen it otherwise if it hadn't drowned. So it is quite interesting to see like the different phases. And then at the drying phase, which is quite interesting because it gives different communities of organisms. So within the aquatic phase, you have your aquatic organisms and everything, but the drying phase and it's losing surface water, it has these um, organisms that come specifically to just the edge of the pond, just between the interface of the water and the recently dry, recently inundated um, terrestrial aspect, and it would feed on organisms there. And that's where I found um, a the, the 
things like that I mentioned earlier. And it was just always along that edge there. It was never in the water. It was never in the terrestrial environment wholly. It was always just at the edge. Oh, interesting. And when it came to the tadpoles of the pond, there were some, whenever the, the pond was drying out and the tadpoles, whenever there were thousands of them, and they died after losing surface water, there would be these sarcophagids and calipories that would come in that wouldn't be there otherwise. So the smell of their decaying um, toad bodies or tadpole bodies attracted wow. them in such large numbers. And it only lasted for like a day or two. So if you miss like those two days, you'd have seen them at all. It would have just been a, a full on mystery. So there's some there's so many tiny intricacies of these uh, water bodies that I'm hoping to show and shed light on when it comes to everybody else knowing more about them cool yeah it's interesting um the way that you describe the temporary water bodies make me think of like uh sorry if this seems sounds graphic for some people but like like a couple weeks ago we had ashley within from uh the national collections in scotland join us and she studies carry-on beetles and so with carrion uh, or dead animals like roadkill, for example, and or just when an animal dies, uh, it 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 creates a habitat or it create unleashes all the, these nutrients and these opportunities for insects yeah. to come. And you have the first wave of insects that come to get like like the the blowflies, which and all those maggots, which like take advantage of the really fresh, like really wet, fresh, like dead animal and then like when that starts to dwindle it starts to dry up then the carpet beetles come in and like maybe some carn some vertebrates some carnivores come and scavenge as well and vultures and then eventually you just get like a whole other completely other um community dynamic at the very end of it so you, that's that helps you tell what stage and like help you helps you predict when the death of that animal occurred and so I'm just thinking the way you're describing these temporal bodies with like the the flooding phase and how there are those unique organisms that pop up there to the drying phase and you see those differences like you're you're seeing the clockwork of this this uh, habitat and environment the succession of it which is really cool it's really cool. I even have some friends that do study um, forensic entomology in Jamaica, and they do see that progression, like you're mentioning, with carrion. You have the different stages of different flies coming in, and I have the that are focused on um, some are doing some are doing California, some are doing sarcophagids, but they're doing um, forensic entomology in general. And it's interesting to see because when I first saw the um the Californians, I was like, these are useless flies. Why are they here? Go away from my book. <laughs> But then the friend that was doing calipories told me that they're pollinators for different plants. I was like, oh, yeah. so my pond is supporting these pollinators. I am honored. It is awesome. So it's interesting to, to, to get that different perspective and that understanding of not just, oh, it's gross, it's a fly, get away. They have different services, different purposes within the environment. And the pond, at the, at the drying phase at least, is able to support that in some extent. And it just, it shows me how interconnected everything is because I wouldn't have thought at that point that flies of those, um, of that caliber would have um, come to the pond and then that they would be so important to other ecosystems. So I realized, oh, everything's just connected. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. Um, are, what, is, what is your temporary pond near? Is, like, is it near a lot of human activity or is it kind of like off to the side out of curiosity? So it, it's kind of both. So it is on the university campus. So people do walk past it every day. People drive past and everything. And it is regularly cut by, by the maintenance staff. Um, but people don't do like sit and stay there or hang out. There's a gazebo nearby, but not many people actually go towards where the pond would be. So it's, even though it is within an urban environment, not many people actually actively flock to it. So it's not as polluted or not as disturbed yeah. as some other areas. Other than I'm, the cutting. Um, I'm curious to ask uh, if if any human activities, if you've noticed changes with your pond and what's there from from human activity. And I'll give an example for my temporary pond that's not really a pond, but like a fountain in <laughs> Philadelphia where when the Super Bowl draft occurred in Center City, Philadelphia, and the city like filled with like thousands of people in the streets uh, for the day right by um, the art museum in Logan Square in Philadelphia. 
um, the next couple of days, when I was sampling the fountain, and uh, I got tons and tons of flies, mm. probably from all the trash or something like that. So <laughs> it's yeah. not like a, it was a very abnormal collecting day that was totally a result of like what was right. going on around. Cause it was a huge event. It was a very huge event. So. So for my point, I haven't seen any of that. There are some instances within the terrestrial aspect that I would see people driving into the pond and kind of crushing some of the plants. Oh no. But yeah. I was so upset when I saw that. It was just like, why must you drive here? There's so many places you could drive otherwise. Why yeah. here? But not my study site. Yeah, not my study site. <laughs> and there was even a point too where someone was asking, so there was a particular plant that was growing there and they were asking if they could harvest the plant. And I'm like, no, leave them. <laughs> Thankfully, the data collection is over now, so they can do what they want with it, not my <laughs> research. But at that time, it was just not not pleasant. But when it comes to the changing um, species like that, I haven't seen where humans specifically cause a, a significant change. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here, Jay in the comments is saying, sorry, I just got here. I thought the guy in the picture was looking for his dropped phone. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's Gavin collecting samples. And I, um, I'm i going to put the YouTube video where it's a really nice video that Gavin put together on his YouTube channel of like a day in the life when he goes out and does his sampling. And very enjoyable video. Yeah, yeah. some fun music in there. And like, yeah, it was really well done. Awesome. Um, so like when it comes to that specifically, um, I was collecting groups or Normally on day, it collect my data, and I would have my phone with me through the notes. Um, thanks, never, and I hope it never ever does. But something I still the phone, what the water is normal for me now. Cautious when it comes through. Oh, Sorry, the audio is a little choppy for me, and I'm just curious what if you guys are uh, over in the chat. Please let us know if you can hear us okay. I did get a notification about there being a partial system outage. I don't know if it's affecting us or not, or if it's just a little mini glitch. But um, I got a notification that a while ago. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully, it is a little. You you sound good to me now, Gavin. So can, you can go ahead and continue. It's a little dark over there. Is the sun setting? I'm getting on your end as well, so it might be influenced by you. Okay. But it's been good. I think that okay. uh, I was just saying, days it would be just I walk through the wind, and hopefully it has never been the case where it's water. Very glad. Yeah, I'm seeing other people are breaking up. No. Other people are going to break up. No. Huh? Sorry, I'm muted. Okay. Maybe we can. Uh, wrap up the broadcast now i suppose so okay it, no problem it's been on for an hour and almost 20 minutes now thank you so much for your time gavin um, if any yeah. if anybody has some uh last questions put them in the chat now um i guess i have a few questions for you gavin like um like how many years in are you and also how many seasons did you sample in the uh the pond and yeah, I'll let's start with those two questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm in my fifth and final year, getting all ready to write up. Oh. And um, I've been collecting for four seasons overall. So from 2017 up to 2020. So 2017, 2018, 19, and 20. So four years of data. But for the, the terrestrial aspect, it's only been the past year. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Very exciting. Yes. When's your anticipated uh, graduation date then? So that one, that one might take some time. So I'm currently working now to finish and wrap up by the end of June to early July. And then after that, it's going to be going through the actual um, 
thesis by the, the examiners and then the actual defense could take some several months so i'm hoping by the end of 2021 but more likely it's going to be the beginning of 2022 Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, ex enjoy your last years or your last year or months yeah. of the program. Yeah, and uh, definitely keep us posted. Um, and do you, do you know? Do you have an idea of what you'll be up to after that, or is that not there yet? Not there yet. <laughs> that is definitely not there yet. So when okay. it comes to doing sciences in Jamaica, they're not much. Um, there are not many opportunities for science, especially at the PhD level. Mm -hmm. So I ideally want to um, relocate or migrate somewhere else. My, my goal right now is the East or the Far East when it comes to oh, wow. Taiwan and Singapore, because I really want to get exposed to like a whole different kind of culture wow, and just yeah. be amazed and immersed by that. Um, but for right now, I have some little consultations that I do in the field. So I do that until I do get an option to go abroad or do something somewhere else and it's kind of scary to me to be in the adult world because I still kind of view myself as a kid <laughs> like I still <laughs> make time to watch cartoons and tv shows every single day so never lose your childhood your childish enthusiasm is one yes, quote I, that I like to say yeah I, I love it and I do not want to lose it so I will do what I can to keep it but also like viewing myself as an adult is something I have to work on because I am an adult now and <laughs> I can't be an adult while watching cartoons every day. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> but okay. <laughs> okay. Thank anyway. you so much for having me. It was an awesome talk. I look forward to hearing more about this, you, and everything else going Cheers. forward. Yeah, keep us posted. Um, love to have you back on in the, again in the future to give us updates. And yeah, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to... Um, Oh, I guess, yeah, for anyone, let me go back, go to this view here. Um, so uh, on on deck, we are, for everyone uh, who's looking into the future for the bug scope, next up, we have Sips and Spiders next, same time next week with Sebastian and I talking about all things spiders. You can come on in, you can come back if you want to, Gavin, share, your, share more spider stories with us. It's a very casual, like anything goes. We talk about anything related to spiders sort of event. And that happens once a, once a month. And then on the 22nd, we're bringing in Autumn Angelis, who is with the Mosquito, New Jersey Mosquito Control. Um, oh, she, she works in New Jersey. And um, she will be talking about mosquitoes, more, more about mosquitoes, great topic. And then on the 4th of May, we have um, Ash, Dr. Ashley Kennedy, who will be joining us to talk about ticks. So... Um, stay tuned, everybody. What do you say? Like, these are the number one things I hate in the field. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, little hitchhiker. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, Bye. thanks, everyone. Have a good evening and take care. <laughs> oh, David still looks like an adult, also. Thanks, David.